Good afternoon, and welcome to our webcast today, uh, The Great Conversation in Security. And the question of the day is, are you feeling powerless to change the perception of your security program? Uh, with that said, I am going to um, do a quick polling question, if you don't mind. Um, before I get to Ron, let's see here. So, polling question. Let me launch it. So how valuable is your security department to your organization? So if you can, take a few minutes and go ahead and um, answer that question. So select from extremely valuable, very valuable, somewhat valuable, and uh, not at all. Uh, and Tim, this is Ron Warman. Uh, um, for those of you who are not directing a security program, you may be a an external consultant or a service provider, answer your impressions of your client's ability to make that value connection to their stakeholders. Okay, okay. so um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close the poll, so stand by. Collecting responses. Um, and I'm gonna share. So. Here we are. How valuable is it? 56% um, extremely valuable, 11% very valuable, somewhat valuable is 33%, and zero not at all. And it looks like I've lost my PowerPoint, so bear with me a second. Here we are. Should be back. You guys see the PowerPoint? Ron? Just We're waiting for it to come back. Okay, hang on. Why is it doing it? Let's hide. There we go. So before I get to the learnings, Ron, I'm gonna just introduce you, uh, who you are. You are Ron Warman. You're gonna be our moderator today. And Ron is the founder and CEO of the Sage Group. Over the last 30 years, the Sage Group has uh, been helping companies build uh, and execute value strategy. So uh, with that said, Ron, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, so I'm just gonna take you to the next slide that uh, is important, uh, which will be talk about the results. And Ron, it's all you, you got it. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Tim. And those results are engaging and absolutely relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Let me just give you a quick synopsis of why we're doing this. The Great Conversation is a forum. It's designed to capture the conversations that are front of mind for security executives and their teams. And like every great conversation, it builds on the previous uh, conversation and the experiences, the lessons learned of each of us. And the hope for result is it results in a network of knowledge that can be leveraged in managing our people who happen to perform roles in our core processes that drive value and mitigate risk in our organization. So the whole idea of a great conversation is transparency. Uh, we're gonna be talking a, in a web, webinar. It's difficult to get transparency, but I think you're gonna find this conversation between the three of us very engaging. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, I love technology, so we're gonna, we're gonna have fun. What we're gonna try to achieve today yeah, what we're, gonna, what we're going to achieve today, hopefully, with your help, is we're going to focus on culture as a lever to strengthen our security program. And in that context, you, we all know vision and mission matter. And the steps to begin a change effort around that, whether you feel it's right now the culture thinks of you as very valuable, you probably are also saying, I can do a lot more. We're going to talk about those steps in the change effort that will help you uh, promote, uh, uh, promote a path to value. And we're also going to be talking to two very experienced people, one a practitioner and one a security executive, about their experiences leveraging culture for security. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, first of all, Wendy Walsh. I'm not going to read this paragraph. What I want to tell you is my experience. She's a principal with the Enterprise Security Risk Group of Aronson Security Group. 
But what she's really doing is with her team of uh, senior, senior security executives with practitioner expertise, she's leading a new category of services called Security Risk Management Services. She has an MA in Organizational Development, and that complements her undergraduate degree in Electrical Engineering. Tyson Aiken uh, was introduced to the Great Conversation Forum last March on the main stage. He's a Senior Director of Global Security for Nike. He's responsible for leading a team that supports the business drivers and value of Nike through the mitigation of risk of Nike's people, their assets, and their core processes that drive that value. Welcome, Wendy and Tyson. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Ron. So one of the things, one of the things we've already talked about, we've been having a great conversation between the three of us, and we thought it would be important to really define that term, culture. That can be an evasive term. So first of all, we're going to turn to one of the leading uh, business magazines and see what they say. And it basically says it refers to the shared values, attitudes, standards, and beliefs. That makes sense characterizes the entire organization. But more importantly is that second paragraph. That culture is rooted in their goals, their strategy, their structure, and their approaches to their external and internal customers. And therefore, what this business magazine was saying is absolutely critical to any business's ultimate success or failure. So I wanted to drive that home a little bit. So we dug up a study, goes back, Oh, probably uh, a few years ago, but it was 207 firms that were polled, public companies, over an 11-year period. And here's what they found. Those with a highly adaptive culture outperform non-adaptive cultures in both revenue, stock price, and net income. These are two senior-level thought leaders in organizational change. And, uh, and this is the uh, polling. It was absolutely an astounding thing for its time and it still applies today. We also found that one of the leading uh, HR firms was talking about this 5% increase in employee engagement fueling revenue growth. But what they really were saying is this is top of mind of most chief executive officers. The idea that they're engaging their people through vision and mission and cultural execution around innovation and change so that they can fuel these kind of results. Absolutely compelling uh, data. So we started to our, ask ourselves around this table we're in that you're listening into, we started to ask ourselves, what does this mean to security? And we came up with a graph that I'd love our two uh, speakers uh, to speak to, and that is a graph around the owner, owners of organizational risk. Wendy? Thank you, Ron. Um, so, Tyson, in, in my work, I've noticed that a lot of the a lot of these uh, these these different officers of companies uh, they don't necessarily make the connection to risk. A lot of times, uh, the security department or the the army of one security person feels like they own that whole risk. And um, I, from a business perspective, I'm finding that these executives. They're the ones who actually own the risk, and the security department is more the manager of what are we going to do about the risk. You know, here's the options of, of of addressing the security risk, and what do you want to do? Is that what you're finding with Nike? That, yeah. that same maybe a little bit of that disconnect. Yeah, I think so. I think we we see that sort of generally. I think throughout the industry, uh, we. we you know, we obviously we get into this industry, we get into the security field because we are people who want to protect and and mitigate risk. That's something that unites us all as as professionals. Uh, um, and I think sometimes that translates into a broad understanding that we own all of that risk. When I think you're exactly right, we <clears throat> we're in in many ways we play a trusted advisor role. You know, we we can advise on risk, we can uh, advise on recommendations on how to mitigate that risk. Uh, I think it goes one step further in my estimation that instead of thinking of ownership of broad, you know, pieces of risk within an organization and the security departments on the side, I think the uh, security departments can can do a unique or have a unique function or can play a unique role in helping all employees understand the level to which they can mitigate the risk that they encounter in their own work streams. So instead of thinking of it as these separate departments, each with a piece of risk, it's 
it's more of a concerted holistic effort on how to raise security awareness among the entire employee base. Does that make sense? It does, and I, I've seen that that whole that that work going on, and it it it, it feels like it then better aligns with the culture of an organization where they talk about, you know, we're one big um, organization moving together and, and stop siloing security as, as something that, that is a part of, but separate from um, how to enable the mission, how to reach the mission of the organization. Yeah, I think that that's right. You know, we, uh, we also struggle in our field with being a cost center. We're not a revenue generating function within most organizations. And so that's uh, sometimes can be perceived as, as, as just a drain. So helping, helping everyone understand what the core mission of security is, what we do, uh, raising that general level of security awareness among that employee workforce uh, or the work base, I, I think is absolutely fundamentally crucial to, to ensuring that we get after our own missions. Um, and that really, that cannot be done without a really good understanding of the organizational culture, whatever, whatever group you're in, corporation, organization, whatever that looks like, without a true understanding of that culture, it, it becomes almost impossible to sell the security cost center as a, as a benefit for the, for the entire organization. Yeah. So let me ask you both, this is really intriguing to me, uh, because I've played the line of business function and I've interfaced to security people as a line of business owner. How do you give me something that allows me to actually achieve my goals, not constrain me? And how do you talk to my culture without fear mongering? I think that is a, th those are great questions. Great questions. At, and I think that the, they can perhaps both be answered with, with, uh, with one line here or with one line of reasoning. Understanding, knowing the, the business culture, understanding and knowing the business language, uh, and really getting to the core of what the business is, what it does, how it makes its money, uh, I think puts us in a position where we can start to have the conversation around how security interfaces with that business. Once you're in the meeting and the business understands or, or, or they get it that you understand what they're doing and you're here to help them, I think the, the mindset seems to shift. You know, I, I, the, the poll was very enlightening to me. 50, I think it was 56% if I wasn't, I, I wrote it down here. I hope I wrote it correctly. Uh, surmised that the security departments within their organizations were viewed as extremely valuable. That is very heartening. Yet I would suspect that, and, and this wasn't an option in the poll, we would all say that it's not valuable enough Right? We're not valuable enough. And, and Ron, you, you talked about this too earlier. Uh, we all want to get better, even if we are seen as extremely valuable. Right? There's, there's always that part where we are uh, maybe kept out of certain conversations or we want to we be involved in, in long-term business decisions and strategic decisions. Um, and I think this is what this question, this alignment with the business culture, the understanding and, and alignment with the business really gets after. Uh, wherever we are, we want to get better. And I think that you know, this is the way we can get better as an industry. And certainly, you know, here at Nike, our organization, we're not perfect. We don't do everything, you know, perfectly well. But when it works, uh, when we do our job well, and I think that our, our entire organization gets after it very, very well, when it works, it's because of this. We're interfacing with business leaders, with stakeholders, with employees. Uh, we're talking about their business and about what they want. Um, that's when it all sort of comes together and really seems to flow. Uh, I have a question from our audience, and it happens to be from a security director. And it aligns with, I believe, what you're saying, Tyson. Uh, it, it's regarding your own company. And again, go to a level of transparency that's suitable for this webinar. Uh, we go deeper into the Great Conversation Forum, uh, where we can share with that under uh, Chat House rules. But back to, back to the question. Do you believe? Nike has that culture today where all staff understand security and their role for the organization. If so, what does it look like? How is that presented or manifested? That's a great question. And, and, and Ron, you, you, you said it exactly right. I mean, obviously, when we're, when we're talking face to face, we've got a lot more. We have the ability to be more transparent with each other. Uh, you know, due to the recorded nature of the webinar, it makes it a little bit trickier. But what I will say, um, and this this comes right into uh, you know the employee experience. 
no matter how good you are, no matter how well integrated you are with your employee base, uh, the reason why you can always do better is, you know, we're, we're all in groups that have a lot of turnover, have some turnover, right? Everybody's different, but there are new employees coming in all the time, both as a broader organization and within the security organization. And it's incumbent upon us as leaders to ensure that that level of awareness is imparted to the new onboarding employees. Uh, if you're not careful, and this is this is separate from security, I mean, this is general business. If we're not careful, that that culture can begin to dissipate over time with you know with new employees through no fault of their own, right? They bring their own experiences and and work histories to the table, and that's great. Um, but if you want or have a culture that you would like to maintain, and certainly from a security point of view, I think we all do, you have to ensure that you get in, uh, you get into the conversation right when the employees come on board. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a backstory here, um, and, and I'm going to preface it with this. The only reason we have success here at Nike uh, the integration of, of, of us within the bar broader business culture, I should say, not the only reason, but the foundational reason of our success is that we hire people <clears throat> who get it, right? There are a lot of people in the world who have a lot of security. They're probably fantastic in many organizations. We really make a focused effort to hire uh, around fit, around cultural fit, if someone fits at Nike, but also within the global security department. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been here a few years, uh, been at Nike five years, um, and we've grown a lot in those years. I think we've, we've been successful because we have hired so well. And I am very fortunate to have a wonderful team of support uh, on all sides, above and below and on and, and peers. Uh, we have a lot of people who are interested in protecting the brand. And so... Um, I want to lead in, and you can all see the image of the turnstiles here. Uh, when we sort of first started our global security project, so to speak, uh, it was a total reset of how security was viewed. We had a concerted goal on how we wanted to change that. Um, but more importantly, we wanted to get to a place where we protected, uh, you know, those things that all security professionals want to protect, right? People, places, uh, product and process, the assets themselves, right? So, um, when we first started, we had a wide open campus. Uh, originally, we were designed uh, around a university style to, to encourage growth and collaboration and communication. Um, and, and for that purpose, it, it functions very, very well. But these buildings were, you know, they were built you know, over, over 20 years ago. And, you know, the, the security mindset in a sleepy corner of Oregon was far, far different back then. So, in order to better protect our employees and our assets, uh, we wanted to maintain tighter access control over our buildings, you know, like we all do, right? I mean, this is a, this is a common theme for everyone. Um, and the way we were able to do that, I think, was really understanding the business. We're fortunate to have individuals within our organization that, that have been at Nike for a long time, um, who speak the language, who are from here, um, and so when we go and talk to the business about the expenditure, because, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at fundamentally changing the way you do business. Um, and we were a little concerned that people were going to be hesitant around the, the implementation of the turnstiles. Uh, when in reality, people were waiting for this. We have a very savvy workforce that travels all over the world. Uh, they've been exposed to all, form, all, all forms and sorts of access control overseas. And what it came down to is people were sort of waiting for this and needed a champion of change, and our department provided that. Um, and I think the way that we were able to do it so successfully was the integration into the culture itself. What a great lesson. I, um, I, I'll have to look at our attendee list to see if we have any HR professionals there. What a great lesson, though, for HR and security. Let's not assume security is a bad thing to our employees, right? Oh, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And, uh, you know, in, there's there's plenty of open source articles about the open nature of Nike. Uh, we went into it with a really focused effort to maintain that open culture, but also provide some level of security for our employees. Uh, for those, you know, if anybody's ever out here, we can walk around our campus. I'm happy to show you around. Uh, we we really carefully thought about how these turnstiles would work, how they would be integrated, how they would look, make sure that it 
fit all points of Nike's culture, and, and, and I think it's been a great success for, for that reason. That's awesome. We got one more minute, and then I'd like to uh, have Wendy weigh in with her experience, but we have uh, another question from the audience, uh, so very quickly. Um, it's around the nature of culture again, but at times, many companies don't know if Nike is doing so. Please share if it is. Sure. But a lot of times, companies are outsourcing seen a part of or all of their security to another mm -hmm. entity. Now, yeah. Can that be done in a culturally significant way? Yeah, I think so. And we can respond quickly. This is, you know, this is something certainly for a much longer conversation and hopefully we could have that mm -hmm. in March. Uh, that is absolutely right. As a, you know, here we have some outsource, some, some in-house, uh, and I think everybody's probably in that same boat. You've got to make quick changes, and that sometimes means outsourcing certain projects. Fine. Uh, but real effort needs to, to be around the maintenance of security, but also helping those, those people that come from the outside, helping them integrate into the culture. And many times we want to get started on a project. We want to go. Here's what we do, and we're off to the races. When in reality, if we just take a moment to pause and help people coming in to get integrated into the culture, helping the, culture un helping, you know, the established culture understand the new people coming in, uh, if you take time to think about it and plan around it, I think that that it can help mitigate some of those stresses. And it obviously is much more difficult with an outsourced company, but it can be done. So if there's any service providers on this call, take note. More and more executives uh, like Tyson here may be interviewing you just like they do with their employees for your cultural fit. Let's go to Wendy Walsh now. Wendy has a broad experience with many different vertical sectors. And Wendy, if you can share how you're uh, actually intersecting with the culture and what you're finding. Uh, so one of the things that I found successful in, in deploying security anywhere is the, the concept of making security personal. And, and, I, and I think a lot of us on this call today, we all know that we're doing really important work. And how does that translate to somebody who works in some department who never ever sees you. In my own company, uh, it, it sort of bubbled up for me where one day I heard we were having a conversation around uh, developing the international travel policy. And so I started to ask questions about, well, what about domestic travel? Because we still, we have incidents uh, um, all over the world. And, and how do you prepare your employees uh, for that? And then taking it a step further about, well, what about the employees who aren't traveling on company business? And uh, what, what happens when they're, one of my coworkers, maybe they're traveling um, with, with, their, with their kids for the first time? What happens when you know, their kids go off to college? And are they, do they understand what to do for their own personal safety and security? And could we be developing a kind of security toolkit that doesn't necessarily only, that doesn't only apply to business? And, and to me, kind of translating that through all the different levels of an organization to somebody who all they know about security is that they have a badge and they have to present the, the, the credential at a door so it'll unlock. It, it really helps show how security is woven through the entire fabric of, of who we are as, as individuals and in, in an organization. And then like with Tyson and people were waiting to have some kind of way to improve the access control at, at your campuses, right? Then it starts, people start to see security as part of the culture and an ally um, and, a, and something that, is, that helps the organization meet its mission as opposed to this in my mind, this 80 pound um, backpack that you have to carry around and um, right in, instead of this cost center mentality. Yeah, what, I think a, what you, a great. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Tyson. No, I was just going to say, I think that's exactly right. I think, uh, you know, we, we were talking a few weeks ago about uh, something very similar, Wendy. Um, and I, I remember you, you telling me this this story. I think it's exactly right. I mean, obviously, every organization has a different concept of the duty of care around their employees and what that means. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're people. You know, we want to take care of people. And 
as much as we can do that, raising the overall level of security awareness, it it just makes it so much better for everyone. And and I think you're right, Wendy. It it allows our employees to truly understand that we're here to take care of them uh, and to help them as much as we can, just to provide levels of information and awareness. I think that's spot on. I think that's an incredible concept too, Wendy. This and it and it rises above even security. It's basic business. How do I provide value to the very constituency that I'm trying to win their hearts and minds. And for you to, for an organization to reach out to their employees and say, we want to help you, you know, give you travel insights on your personal or professional travel. That's incredible. Great concept. With yeah, that we have, said, uh, Oh, go, go ahead. ahead, Ron. No, please. Oh, well, I was just going to mention um, very briefly, and again, something we can dive into further at another time. Um, I think I, I mentioned this before, uh, Ron, we were talking about this. Uh, we have an internal ad campaign, essentially. It's a marketing campaign uh, called Keep It Tight, uh, and it is a platform for security communications. It's, it's a modular style, style training. We can have uh, different types of uh, information, right, around uh, whether that's travel security, situational awareness, uh, what have you. And over the years, it's modified and changed to be able to, you know, we've, we provide all sorts of information. And, and so much so, it's, it's entered into the Nike culture so much that that phrase, keep it tight, is a essentially a, it's a commonly used phrase here throughout the organization, and not just here at campus, but globally. Uh, that's obviously gratifying for us to see, but people take it very seriously. And the whole concept of we are all Nike security, which is the sort of the impetus behind the, the campaign, is that People have to take responsibility for themselves, uh, but we're here to help them uh, have the appropriate tools to be able to do that. It's one thing to say to someone, well, you got to look after yourself. It's another thing to say, listen, you're going to be on your own, you know, out there traveling or whatever, but here's some things that will help you be better, help you be, you know, more safe and secure and to be more aware of your surroundings. Uh, providing them tools helps them feel that connection and I think uh, become more involved personally in the overall security mission. So we wanted to leave all of you, uh, and several of you have asked uh, on the questions, ask for next right steps. So I should give you $10 for that segue because we're okay. going to talk now about maybe some suggested next right steps. Wendy and uh, uh, Tyson, can you go over some recommendations they might take um, while we're heading toward the great conversation in March? One of the things that I find um, challenging for a lot of security professionals is that we speak in our own language and um, that we know what to do, and yet the translation into the language that our CEO speaks, the CFO, uh, the right. We, we don't speak the same language and we don't actually understand what their concerns are about how to address security, how to integrate security. And so uh, I, I think that security professionals, that the best way to, to, to change the perception of your security program is really to have conversations with the, the 10 most important uh, people in your, or, in your organization understand what their concerns are, not necessarily about security, but what are their concerns to figure out how security then helps manage some of those concerns. So speaking their language, listening to what their concerns are, and, and understanding that their, their sense of urgency and, um, and asking, asking those questions that help open up that conversation. Oh, Wendy, that is spot on. That is spot on. I, I, I can't agree with you more. I, I, you know, it, it's easy for us to, to talk about this in terms of if you were managing a team in Japan, a team in Brazil, a team in India, a team in China. Uh, if you want that process, if you want that management process to be successful, you really have to understand, you know, all the intricacies and changes with, uh, within a foreign culture, right? That's that's just going to help you be successful. And so often we think, well, it's, you know, it's American to American or it's, you know, it's, it's British to British for a British company. And so when I, when I go in and talk to uh, members of the C-suite, we often think that it's an American to American. We're going to understand each other. When in reality, just as you said, Wendy, we're speaking a security language. 
and we need to be able to translate that into the language of the business. And you can't really do that without learning the business, understanding their work, and then helping them understand yours. And once that process happens, it just seems to flow. Uh, and so oft times, I mean, yes, we're security professionals, but really what we're doing is translating. We're translating our work uh, into the language of the business. And I love that. With that segue, let's, um, let's understand. We had a very brief 30-minute conversation, and uh, we're running out of time. Uh, those of you who have submitted questions, we promise to get back to you. Uh, and also, we want you to engage with speakers. We have put together a contact email, info at thegreatconversation.com. And you can send it in. We will make sure those questions get directly to the speaker and uh, get you an answer. And uh, those answers are going to help these conversations we have all year long help build upon conversation to conversation, what ultimately culminates in the great conversation in March. Here's four other, five other, four other, five other, four other. Four other webinars that we'll be conducting all the way to the Great Conversation. And some are, uh, you can see, some of them are fairly provocative. The insecurity of security, uh, the whole idea of machine learning, how it's going to change security, uh, the role of intelligent communications, and then access control is something many vendors are doing now, but it's not who they are becoming. So we're going to talk about highways and on-ramps along those lines. So with that said, uh, we invite you uh, to the March event and to the subsequent webinars. Tim, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ron. Uh, Ron of the Sage Group. Thank you, Wendy of Aronson Security Group and Tyson of Nike. That actually, I was going to say an awesome conversation, but that was a great conversation. Um, as Ron said, this was the first in a series of webcasts. Join us for the next great conversation and security webcasts on November 15th, the insecurity of security. With that said, I think that's it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you on November 15th. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Tim.